Hi, I'm Tim Crofts from LinkedIn, uh, production and infrastructure engineering team. And that's basically the bit that serves the LinkedIn.com website. Um, we've, we've been working uh, towards V6. It was, it was predominantly pushed when um, IPv6 day was uh, announced what, when it, way back. Unfortunately, we missed that deadline. I'll go through uh, next slide. So this is a brief history of, of, uh, of LinkedIn itself. So obviously, we missed the, the deadline, but we uh, started delivering email uh, in 2013. Um, so that was our first V6 piece. But in the background, we were actually working on getting V6 at the front end of our network as well. Eventually, eventually um, <clears throat> uh, LinkedIn.com became V6 on the 9th of uh, 2014. Um, we would have liked to have done the uh, 6th, but the, the 6th was a Friday, and we typically don't push production changes on a Friday because people want to enjoy their weekends. So we uh, switched it on on the, on the 9th. Today, about 50% of our traffic is V6. And one of the drivers for that is the mobile networks. Um, you've already heard from uh, EE. Uh, in the US, you've got T-Mobile, which is V6 only. Um, so that's where most of our traffic comes from. So we then, after we completed the, the task for pushing V6 uh, into the front end, um, we we were looking at what, what else needs doing, and we were looking at the way we allocate, you know, build our data centers out. Uh, we have a lot of servers, not as big as Facebook and Google, but we still have a lot of servers. And we were starting to, the way we allocated our V4 space, we'd kind of chewed up a lot of it. So we were getting, getting close. We could continue to run, but the problem with actually kicking the can down the line is that you suddenly get to a point where you uh, you actually do need to actually do it. And if you do it really fast, you're going to do a bad job. So we thought, OK, let's start to plan getting V6 into our data centers. So when we'd actually got V6 at our front end, we'd already done a hell of a lot of work on all of the networks that support it. When you're actually converting um, a website to run V6, you obviously need to be able to test that you're, you've got V6 connectivity. When we were doing all this work, the, the, the ISPs uh, around us didn't really have V6 presence. So if you're getting people to try and test to say whether the website works on V6, we needed our corporate network to actually be running V6 internally. So we've got this concept of the, uh, the network where all of the employees sit, and then you've got the, the data center itself, and then you've got the front end of the website, which is V6 enabled, so the middle bit's V4, but we'd already built our business network out as V6. So all of our engineers were sitting on machines that were dual stack with V6, and that was really important for them testing the, the pieces. Um, so we'd, done, we'd enabled that. We'd already enabled our edge network, and we'd also enabled our VPNs. Now, the reason behind enabling our VPNs is that our engineers don't just work when they're at work, they work when they're at home. They're pretty dedicated. So when they go home, they go and sit, sit there, and this is back in, what, 2012, 2011. They would go home, and they would sit down, and there would be no V6 on their machines, so they wouldn't be able to test anything. So what the um, IT department did was basically enable all of our, v our VPNs so that when an engineer dialed in, he would get a V6 address magically. So our VPNs were connected. And as I said earlier, we'd, we were um, delivering email over V6 as well. So what was left to do? Well, the data centers, which is a pretty big space. Um, we have a lot of servers across, strewn across the entire US, and we have um, uh, in Asia as well. We also have little pockets of data centers as well, which basically bring traffic into our network across our backbone. So we had to, we, what's left to do is basically our production network, the servers, uh, our staging and testing environments, you know, the network itself and the servers. Management networks. Um, I'll, I'll explain that a bit because uh, maybe, maybe people won't know what it is, but each server actually has another server running, computer running inside it to actually manage it. 
and then all of the racks themselves have uh, PDUs in them. They've all got Ethernet on board, so they're on a network as well. That's the management network I'm talking about. It's the, the management to manage the devices within the network. And then the backbone itself, all of the networks that join together all of our data centers. And then the uh, intranet services, I put it, that's things like uh, ticketing systems, um, uh, uh, any tools that people use on a day-to-day -day basis needed to be converted to V6. So we had, we had to come up with a plan of action. So we established a, you know, a working group so we could put together you know, the ideas of how we were going to progress this forward. Uh, and then we targeted our staging environment, which is where we build all the code before we deploy it to our production networks. Um, the area of the company I work in is more of the core services of, of, the, um, of, of the server infrastructure. So I'm talking about things like NTP, Syslog, DNS, Kerberos, SMTP. So as a first step, we actually wanted to make sure that all of those services were converted to V6 before we started doing the rest of the work. So as we, were, as we went down this list, we, we, we basically targeted all these things. I'll talk through each of them. Uh, we decided to actually add um, V6 with no Quad A records. Um, and that, that, there's a quite important part behind that. If, if, you're, if you've got V6 on a box, but you, you talk to another machine and you do a lookup of that box, if it hasn't got a V6 address, you're not going to talk V6 to it unless you use the V6 address, and that would be stupid. Um, so we actually deployed all of our boxes with V6 addresses, but no Quad A records. And that allowed us to actually control how we deployed to you know, V6 out as a rollout. One of the other things is we then would be able to slowly target adding Quad A records to turn on services to V6. So if you have a particular service and you know that that service is ready, you can then add a Quad A record to it and then it will then start using V6 because the OS will prefer V6 over V4. As part of the working group, we actually wanted to get more than just the system people on board to V6. So we then had to expand that out to our engineering teams. So we, we then started to get the engineering teams to look at their applications and start to make sure that they would be able to turn on V6 as well. Uh, and we slowly increased as we go through. Um, the other thing is when you build new data centers, uh, it's kind of important that you actually understand whether the equipment is actually going to run V6 in the first place. Um, so it, it, it's ideal with a new data center to start rolling out V6 from day one. So that's one of our data centers, actually. Um, it's in Oregon. Um, it was newly built. And we actually rolled that whole data center out as dual stack from the start. So you heard earlier something about you know, how, how do you divide all this up. So working group, a lot of it was spent in time talking about how we were going to lay the, the addresses out. We had numerous conversations. It went over weeks and weeks of people coming up with different ideas of how we were going to do it. We were going to basically embed various pieces on the, the host portion of the V6 address, like what service was running in it, in some of the quibbles and whatever. Um, but what we ended up doing is we didn't want to take V4 with us. We decided to drop the last two octets of the V4 address. And there's, there's a, a reason behind that. Um, when you're actually running without a Quad A record, it means if you're trying to do a, an ACL for a, for a firewall, if you're using the name, you'd get back the, the, the IP address. But if you haven't got a Quad A record, you're not going to get that. So we needed some way of actually generating the IP address of the V6 for the V6 piece so we could still control, uh, create V6 rules in our firewalls. Because obviously, if, if we're actually creating V6 addresses on boxes and we're going to push traffic out to it, we need to be able to pass that through the firewall. Otherwise, 
it's going to get blocked if we can't calculate it. So that was the reason why we didn't, in, we wanted some portion of the v, v4 address in there, but we didn't want to take the whole lot. And in, not in, I don't think it was a bad thing we did, but if it could, we could have done it easier by just embedding the whole v4, but we wanted to try and break away from you know, taking lock stock the v4 address. We, we, we already want a complete break. So that when we drop v4 away completely, we can still come up with an arbitrary number in that, in that first quibble. And the final piece on there is all of our boxes have exactly the same gateway, FE80 colon colon 1. So that made configuration of a box really, really easy and straightforward. And that was a little uh, snippet that was given to us by uh, the Facebook team when we met up with them. That was one thing they wish they'd have done. I don't know whether they've actually retrofitted or done that. Maybe they can answer. But that has been golden for us. Basically, the configuration is really simple. We just calculate the V6 address. We put FE80 colon colon 1, and the box has got V6 on it. And then when we're ready to ramp it up, we just put a quad A record on, and then we're done. So some of the findings as we went through, through this whole process. So from, from my perspective, I, I did a lot of the conversion work on this. So DNS, that just worked. It was, if it didn't work, the rest of the internet would be broken. <laughs> Kerberos was one of the things that I was, uh, was a bit concerned about at the time, but that happened to just work as well. A lot of the fixes for that had been pushed into, I've actually got the version numbers if anybody really cares, um, something like 513 of Kerberos. Um, so a lot of work had been done on that. Um, NTP, this was one of the ones that really, really caused us a bit of a problem. Um, if you actually look up any of the N NTP uh, you know, forums and that. You'll see there's a lot of requests about it. And there are some parameters in there, but it doesn't really work very well if, if it, in, when, you, when you start it up. Basically, when you start the NTP daemon up on a, on a Linux server, it reads the config, and then that's what it sticks with. And if a server goes away or turns to v6, it never re, 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 re does that lookup. So, when we are actually pushing our NTP configuration out, uh, it, it kind of made it a, something to be aware of, especially if we were going through firewalls <laughs> and we needed it to uh, make sure we got connectivity correct. Um, Syslog works as well, but there was a gotcha with that. Um, so our security team, uh, when they were analyzing our logs, they didn't like the idea of seeing this hunking back big V6 address that was on the file system. So we have not turned on the listener for V6 for syslog as at this point. We've tested and it works, but they don't, don't want our syslog entries that are categorized in a directory to be with V6. They want the reverse lookup that happens to have the name. So we've not turned on syslog. SSH is another funny one. The default config that most clients use is that if you SSH to a box, um, it'll do a lookup. But if that lookup fails, it won't ever time out unless you've got an explicit config. So we had to push a config to our engineers so that we would have some sort of timeout that if it failed, it would roll on to the next address, which would be the v4 address. So. I've talked about all the system sides uh, of, um, of what we were doing. We've also got now the engineering side of stuff. So there's various languages that are used within, um, within LinkedIn. The actual application itself, the actual website, is written in Java. Uh, Java's pretty powerful when it comes to giving the control of how it listens. Um, and we'll go a bit further into that a bit later. And other two languages we use, which are mainly more for, for tooling stuff, is Python and Ruby. So Python and Ruby, uh, you have a lot of con you, have, you have control over it uh, for a listener, so you can fire up a listener, uh, and it'll just work. Um, some of the applications that we use in the back end, Hadoop, uh, was one of the big bugbears for us. Um, in the early days of Hadoop, they ripped out the V6 stack completely. Um, thankfully, Facebook put it back in, and we worked with them and our Hadoop team, and now pushing towards. Uh, pushing towards v6 for a dupe. Um, Couchbase is another application that we use in, in our network. 
And up until probably about three months ago, that had no V6 support whatsoever. Uh, they pushed it in, um, mainly from us bugging them about it, that we, we, we wanted it. So we've, they finally, and we're just actually testing that at this point in time. And then I also talked about uh, like the internet services. We actually use JIRA as our ticketing system confluence for, for our wiki. Um, we've had numerous talks with these guys. They're based in Australia. So we have to pick our time when we speak to them. But they keep promising us v6. They actually have a cloud instance of it, which is v6 supported. But uh, they're still trying to actually build a v6 instance for the on-prem solutions. Uh, the Java piece, there's a lot of configuration you can do with that. I said I'd come back to it. So you can set it up that it will listen on v6, but when it makes an outbound connection, if it gets a quad A record back, it will actually make a connection over v4 if you tell it to. And it's all in the startup script when you actually start the Java uh, app up of what, how it's going to behave. So that was another good control point for our applications that we could start an application up and say, OK, this one isn't quite ready for v6 yet, so start it up in v4 mode. But the boxes it's talking to may have quad A, quad a records on them. So um, earlier it was mentioned that measure it, and that is really key. This is a snapshot of a, a tool that we use to work out um, the status of our v6 deployment. Um, it's, it actually pages down, so it's really quite long. And then there's some tabs across the top which tell you whether uh, this is overall status tab, but uh, there's a host readiness and an application readiness. Because obviously our hosts run multiple applications, so we have to work out that way. I thought I'd take this one because this gives you a, like a, a rough idea of what our, our, our network looks like. You can see a, the, the testing environments at the top portion of that first piece and our production networks. This is our brand new data center, this one here, which is green for a complete V6 deployment. Um, the ones that have got red on them are boxes that are running Couchbase. <laughs> uh, so they haven't been turned on. And then you can see our test environments are pretty heavily V6. And then where we've got Quad A records, these are obviously our testing environments where we've got you know, Quad A records everywhere, so uh, as much as possible. Um, and then down the bottom, you've got our production networks. Mm -hmm. This is actually going at quite a rate. We're, we're making quite a lot of headway on this. So, one of, the, one of the reasons why I kind of titled it the way, you know, you know, the beginning and the end, V6 only, is when you're actually running the amount of servers you run, running dual stack is painful. Because when somebody comes to you with a problem, you've not only got to look at V4, you have to look at V6. Because you have to work out whether the traffic is actually going over V6. So it's resource hungry, because you've, you've got to maintain, yeah, you do extra work. You've got to do double, double, double the work. You've got double the amount of memory required on the routers and stuff, and probably more because of V6. And then maintaining ACLs. I mentioned to you ACLs earlier that we needed to be able to generate them. And then debugging. You've got to also debugging V4 and V6. So if you're actually doing this, and you're actually looking at removing V6, treat it as a stepping stone, please. So what happens if you do remove V4? So about two months ago, um, Frank and myself, he's the, he's the uh, c uh, chair with me in the V6 working group. And I said to him, I think we're very, very close to being able to remove V4. So the way our network is built, as you could see from the start, is we have this production network. And I talked about a business network. Well, we have a interconnect, because we don't allow people to directly talk. So we have these bastion hosts. Um, so I was monitoring these bastion hosts, and every time I looked at it, about 99.9% .9 of the connections on that bastion host were v6. And I thought, OK, let's, let's see whether we can actually remove v4 from these boxes. And then I started to think about it, and we, we talked you know, amongst ourselves, and thought, OK, well, if we remove v4 of it, off it, it won't be able to talk to the, to the v4 boxes in our production network. So we can't do that. So, what I decided to put down as an idea was to actually use SSH to actually deny v4 requests. 
Also, I couldn't take the quad A record, the the the, the A record off the box either because inbound connections might be needing that name to come in. So I couldn't take the A record off here. So what I decided to do was select our networks and where our engineers are and basically stop them connecting. Uh, and that config there is, is a SSH config which basically says match these addresses, um, public key, banner, and then I force command which is, uh, runs a script on the box. And that script basically comes out with this message. And the idea behind this was to actually get any broken machines in our network to be fixed. Because the biggest problem is now is that we've got, you know, potentially all of our connections coming in via V6, but if we're, if we're just blindly ignoring these V6 connections that are broken, we're not treating it equally with V4. So we're trying to get to this point where we treat V6 as you know, first class systems in, in our network. And also it gets the developers to think about V6. If they suddenly can't connect and they see this banner come up and they can't do their job, they're thinking, oh man, what's this V6? Our engineers don't typically talk like that, but there's, there's a few that do. Um, so that's, that's how I approach this. And I actually implemented this on our team's bastion host. I actually stopped my boss from connecting to the network. Um, I remember getting a message, uh, bleep, Tim, what have you done? <laughs> the message I actually put on our box was a bit more um, uh, sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, the bit at the top actually actually shows you um, what happens when a box traverses our uh, of the the V6. So the the inbound connection comes in here, and this is the outbound onward. We use most most of, most people actually don't use them as jump boxes. They use what's called netcat, where you uh, you do a proxy command. So you actually log onto the box transparently, kind of thing and it pushes the connection outbound, and that's what that is. Um, uh, you, that's kind of the, this is from LSOF at the top here. Okay, a uh, picture of uh, 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 Star Trek, I have to put that in. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the challenges for us has been imaging. Um, Imaging boxes, and this is back onto our, our management network. That was a pretty painful process. Um, we, we actually use a company called Supermicro for, for the compute, for compute that we use. Although we are actually uh, making our own computers now. So we have a lot more control over what's in the actual firmware on the box. So Pixie over, over IPv6, all of these these things are, are not ideal. And as I said to you earlier, when we build a data center, it's, uh, you, you've got to do it, you've got, you've got to make sure the equipment supports it because if you actually flash firmware on 30,000 boxes, that can be dangerous and pretty sketchy if it, if it goes wrong, if you brick you know, half, your, half your nodes. Um, provision is, I've kind of gone over this piece, with the, you know, we have to pick a location. It takes us about a year to actually work out where we're going to build a data center, pick the location, the design, order the hardware. So if the hardware doesn't support it, it we're stuck with it for the life of that data center, which is a fairly long time in, in, in technology's timeline. This, this was uh, something that Frank and I put together uh, when we were actually testing this to build our previous data, you know, the data center we just built. And we actually managed to get it to image over V6 with Pixie on these boxes. It was, it was pretty gnarly to do because uh, DHCP v6 didn't work on the box. So it actually traversed Slack. And then you can see here. And then it then booted in uh, uh, and then it imaged itself over that process. Um, it's far from ideal. Uh, I need to check back to see whether all the grub pieces have been fixed. But running Slack inside an enterprise network isn't, you know, inside a data center isn't ideal. So this is kind of my concluding slide of, of you know, bullet points of what we've learned as we've gone, gone through. You've got to ask your, your vendors. And we've spoken to telcos. We've handed uh, at the, the people who provide us our cell phones in the US. 
uh, of why they don't support v6. Um, server provisioning, it does work, but it's very painful at this point in time, although I need to revisit that. <laughs> um, get, get, get developers on board, because if they don't understand v6, you're just not going to go forward. And I think that's been a, a theme that we've heard earlier today is that people need to think about v6 first. You've got to measure, that was also mentioned as well. When you're actually in, in the actual process of deploying, you can actually control it by rolling out Quad A records to actually make the connections happen, or actually you know, uh, bit, uh, switches inside the startup routines. Yeah, the main core services for the internet work. When you go into this, have a plan. Uh, and it would be ideal if I could have just turned off V4 and put v V6 on, which would have been a dream, but that's never going to happen. <laughs> and that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> have any questions for Tim? It looks like Pete's raising half an arm. Hi, Pete Stevens, Mythic Beasts. Um, we looked at Hadoop a while ago for a couple of customers, and you are correct. It is the worst example of a piece of software you can try and run on v6. It's improved. It no longer it, no, it will now start up if you have a v6 address, which it didn't for a long time. Um, what I'd be really interested to know is, have you managed to get v6 Hadoop really working? And is that pushed back into public repositories? So can I go and build v6-only Hadoop from public sources? Say that last bit again. Like the, so, I, can I download Hadoop and build a V6-only Hadoop cluster using only public I, sources, or do I need? I don't know whether access? Facebook have released that back into the community. I think. Uh, you can find out. Cool. Okay. Uh, uh, we can find out. Apparently. Yeah. I, I I know they gave us a release of it. Um, and they, they, they share a lot with our Hadoop team. Uh, but I, I think, I, what I want to say that they actually have committed that code back. But yeah, that was painful. Yeah. 